Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. Welcome to Crosspoint. We are an inclusive faith community seeking to live out the loving, just, and generous way of Jesus. We are participants in a long tradition that's less concerned with doctrines and dogma that demand total agreement, but a life to be lived, enjoyed, and given away to others. What unites us is a growing awareness that life is precious, that we are made by love in order to love. This community is comprised of and affirms the entire human family, regardless of race, age, creed, physical abilities, marital or economic status, gender identity, or sexual orientation. So, if you are curious and have come to see, if you are tired and have come to rest, if you are grateful and have come to share, if you are wounded and have come to heal, if you are joyful and have come to celebrate, if you are uprooted and have come to belong, welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Welcome home. Good morning, Crosspoint, and happy Father's Day to all the dads joining us today. Father's Day is the perfect time of year to celebrate the loving and caring men in your life. Whether it's an uncle who inspired you to follow your dreams, your grandpa who always manages to put a smile on your face, a caring neighbor who's willing to include your kids in their fun, your own dad who always put his family first, really anyone who's been a father figure to you. Make sure you express your love and gratitude for him on this third Sunday in June. But for some, Father's Day is a constant reminder that what others have to celebrate, you either never had or no longer have. There's space for that pain here. And I'm grateful that family isn't just about the group of people you were born into, but about the group of loved ones you have found who unconditionally care for you and support you and become your people. Yesterday, we had a chance to celebrate some parents and their people at Baby Dedication. Baby Dedication is a celebration of some little ones, but it's more importantly a chance for parents to stop for a few minutes and focus on what will really matter most in the life of their child. I've been a mom for a long time, but I still have moments when I struggle with knowing how to parent well. Each phase of parenting brings its own challenges and its own rewards. I'm so thankful for our circle of family and friends that were there to hold us up when times were tough and celebrate with us in the big and the little things. We all need others walking alongside us on this parenting journey. And all kids at every phase of their life need other voices who make them a priority. Yesterday at Baby Dedication, parents had the opportunity to share their hopes and dreams for their children with the people in their life who love them and want to support and encourage them. They focused on four questions. What are some words that describe the person that you want your child to become? Whose voice do you need to hear in your life as parents? Whose voice does your child need to hear? Who are you intentionally asking to be inside your child's circle of influence? Crosspoint, as these parents focused on the idea of what matters most in their family's life, I hope that we too will think about what matters most, that we will take the opportunity to come alongside these families, cheer them on, be there for them when they need it. Just as family ministry commits to partnering with parents as they raise their children, you as their church community can do it too. I searched the world It couldn't fill me Mines of the praise And treasures that fade Are never enough You came along
There are many ways we collaborate with each other to be the church we're called to be and to serve how we serve. And our contributing financially is one of the most important of those ways. If you want to help fund and sustain what we get to do together, go to crosspoint.org contribute to see the many simple ways that you can do so. You can even text CrossPoint NC to 77977 to receive a link to get started now. Thank you for your partnership in the work we do together.
The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. When I was much younger, a friend invited me to hang out with his family uh, over the weekend at this lake in the Midwest. And one day we went out in the boat in the morning and we went to this place they always went. It was like this giant water cul-de-sac and the back of it was a cliff face. It's completely surrounded by trees. And you, you, you drive back and you jump out of the boat and swim the rest of the way to the cliff and then you climb the, the zigzaggy trails up the cliff face to the top and you get up there and there's a whole line of people who've done the exact same thing. They've all, we've all got life jackets on, they're all waving down at the boats, the people in the boats, and, and then one at a time, they would go out on this little pointy piece of rock that, that overlooked the whole cul-de-sac, and it's about 45 or 50 feet above the surface of the water. And people were insisting that there had been a drought that summer, and so the water level of the lake was down about five feet. So according to my calculating, that pointy little ledge then was about seven miles above the surface of the water. And that's how it felt anyway, because I, I was and am extremely acrophobic, terrified of heights. And it's only gotten worse as I've gotten older. I, I, I can't even clean out my own gutters without a harness and carabiners and ropes and paying someone else to do it. So this line of people is inching forward on this little ledge uh, to go out one at a time on, uh, off this point and, and jump off. And the people watching from the boats below, they would clap and scream as the, as the person came up. And we're looking down and before we jump, I mean, these people are little tiny people in little toy boats. There's little dots in the water that it took me a minute to figure out that those were fish. And so one after another, people are jumping off this, this little point, and finally it's my turn, and I inch out and then freeze. Something primal puts my body in park and turns off the engine. I could not do it. I couldn't move. I just watched all these other people do it effortlessly. I could not do it. I felt completely overwhelmed with fear. And so after a couple of minutes of staring, I look behind me and the line is getting pretty backed up and I can feel their tension a little bit. So I decide I'm gonna, I'm gonna relieve some of this tension and let somebody go. Maybe the, anybody that hates me will hate me less if I let somebody go in front of me. Well, the next person's a child, maybe eight years old. And I ask him if he, if he wants to go. He doesn't even pause. He shimmies past me, goes off to the point, just steps off gracefully, his, his face in repose, splashes down below. Everybody's clapping and screaming as he comes up. And of course, I'm clapping and cheering too. Yay, little boy. But inwardly, I'm thinking, you know, that your parents probably don't like you. So here's the thing. It's my turn again. That, that was like 10 seconds. And, and I wish I could say that watching the child inspired me, but all that did was delay my delaying. I was right back to paralysis. I was right back to thinking about hidden tree stumps or, or submerged barbed wire that had waited a hundred years to, to snag my life vest once I got under the water. I, all of these ideas are in my head. It was impossible to jump. Well, in one of the little toy boats below, this little speck of a person, this is this little old lady. And I can see her, she's got this, poof of, of white hair and then over top of that she's got one of those gambling visors and, and suddenly it's only her voice any of us can hear it's echoing across the water and rolling up the cliff face it's just her voice yelling you can do it honey 
and everybody in line behind me starts laughing and everybody below in the boats starts laughing. Laugh laughter is echoing across the water and they're not laughing at her, they're laughing at the necessity of her cheerleading for me. And I hear her and I hear their laughter and suddenly the idea of not jumping becomes terrifying to me. And so I jump, I didn't jump, I fell off rigidly and made some strange grunting sound on my way down. And then my arms were out when I hit the water, which I don't know if you know this, but it tears your armpits completely off your body. It was painful. There was nothing pretty or graceful about it, but I did it. And I used to tell this story when I was a student in college, pastor. Uh, I used to tell it as an illustration about conquering fear, which sure on one level, it, it maybe works that way. What I didn't realize though, until I, I got much older, fairly recently in life, that it was more a story about being paralyzed by fear and then totally motivated by fear. It's a story of fear calling all the shots. It took me a while to recognize that this story was sort of a symbol of my own relationship to fear, how it has con controlled my inaction and my actions. And it, which has helped me recognize that this is the case for many of us. So today we're going to wrap up this series, Nine Monsters, talking about the vice named fear. And while I can't make or, 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 or try, I wouldn't try to make in anyone unafraid, my hope is to highlight fear today, how it keeps us from doing things, forces us to do other things, and makes life feel like surviving a, a minefield rather than the blessing that life actually is. And to be clear, there are many ways of being afraid. Some of us, we feel relational or social fear all the time, but with some reflection, we find that most of that tends to be a kind of shame. It comes from a, 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 a sense of inadequacy. And this isn't precisely where we're going today as we talk about fear, because we've, we've, we've touched on that kind of fear in earlier messages in this series. And I should also note here that that I talk about fear today, aware that many of us have been, th been through some stuff. We've taken some very particular hits and been wounded and traumatized in some very particular ways. And our fear that we feel about that is how we're keeping ourselves from being harmed any further that way. And, and that's totally normal. That, that fear isn't sinful. It's not weak. It's not unhealthy. It's not unspiritual. That fear is how you are working through a particular thing, making sure that particular thing doesn't happen to you again. I'm aware of this. I honor this. I'm not talking about fear this way really either. I'm talking about fear as a vice, something that has dogged some of us our whole lives because early on in our life, when we were really small still, we got the idea that the world was a very dangerous place and so were the people in it, mostly dangerous. So we learned to keep our eyes and ears open, stay a little suspicious, a little obstinate, a little doubtful, just to be safe. And so it's, it's more future oriented. It's, it looks forward and lives in preoccupation with the hazards up ahead. We can think of it as a, like a persistent threat forecasting, a near constant fixation on what might go wrong, how peril is right around the corner. And so you've got to, you've got to be ready for it. You got to square up. You got to align yourself with the right people and the right ideas and get the wrong people away and the wrong ideas away from you. It can be a, I don't know what my boss meant by that, but I know it's bad. It can be a, I'm not sure what this change in budget means to my position here at the company. I just know it means something bad. It can be doing this thing will expose me to risk. And so I will not do that thing because I cannot be exposed to risk. It, it can be this person I'm trusting might be secretly evil and therefore I will not trust them. There's, there's countless variations on this threat forecasting, this worrying, always assuming something bad is coming. And sometimes that fear will stop you in your tracks. And other times it creates a different sort of constriction altogether where what's feared is the fear itself. Like, being afraid is going to get you mistreated or left out or wounded. And so we overcompensate and fear is expressed in this case by being controlling or dramatic or obstinate or intensely negative or cynical with people. So fear fights, fear flees, fear freezes. In any case, fear is master and Lord and demands all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It reduces 
being human beings made in, in the image of God into fearful survivors of the animal kingdom who, who can't really enjoy living because they're stuck merely avoiding death so often. Maybe you recall Peter when Jesus is arrested, he denies knowing Jesus three times and he runs away weeping as the rooster crows. He knows if he knows Jesus, he's going to get arrested, maybe killed too. Well, before that, he tried to cut a man's head off with a sword when he was, the guy was arresting Jesus. It, Peter was terrified, fight or flight. In both cases, Peter is ter terrified. Fight or flight is all we have access to when we're living in the constricting vice of fear. And what's interesting is years later, Peter would quote Psalm 34 when he wrote, those who desire life and desire to see good days, let them keep their tongues from evil and their lips from speaking deceit. Let them be honest people who do no harm and let them turn away from evil and do good. Let them seek peace and pursue it. It seems to me like in time, Peter had learned to not live in the throes of fear all the time, but was starting to live out of a deeper wisdom where what you do and say is motivated by what is good and, and peace and life giving, not simply built on avoiding what might turn out badly. And do know Peter still felt fear late in life, but he was no longer at its mercy. Because fear isn't evil. It's not something you can get rid of. In, in fact, you have to understand fear has been many times very good for our species. An absence of fear is the absence of a survival instinct, which that would have been the end of Homo sapiens a long time ago. Fear isn't evil. We're not trying to get rid of fear. We're trying to wake up to it. Ask yourself, why would you be in a survival stance today? Not that your life is easy. That's not the question. What is constant vigilance providing you? And once we see how fear feels productive, it feels right, but it's actually a vice, we begin waking up to what's actually a fixation on possible danger and waking up to what was really a constant waste of energy, this constant drip. And once we awake to it, we can take away fear's driver's license and say, look, I know you're not gonna leave for, I know I can't get rid of you, you can come along. You're just not driving anymore. That's what waking up to fear means. But one of the clever little tricks that our fears pull on us is that it feels naive, it feels stupid to not be worried, to not be afraid. How many of us, when we're told we're, we're worrying or we're being negative, our response is, well, I'm not being negative, I'm just being smart. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worrying, I'm not being negative, I'm, I'm being realistic. And one of the reasons for that is because our fears, in this, in this sense, are future-oriented. And so they feel very calculated. They're thoughtful, it seems. Fear makes a very believable case that what's coming is bad. I've thought about this. And so those of you that get caught in this fear, you tend to already be forward thinkers. You were probably born creative problem solvers. You see challenges before the rest of us do, and you see their solutions before the rest of us do. And hey, maybe sometimes you come off like a wet blanket in a, in a meeting, but a wet blanket, frankly, might be the only way that we're gonna survive the coming fire. Foresight is your superpower. And add to this superpower of foresight, you care a lot. You care deeply. You're, you're a caring person who cannot just shrug at the storm clouds on the horizon that no one is acknowledging. Something has to be done. Shelter needs to be found. And so what others call worry, you call prepared. But as this forward seeing constricts into threat forecasting, perpetual, constant threat forecasting, which it does starting at a very early age. And maybe you remember the moment, the season that did it for you. It constricts and becomes a way of being that can barely breathe anymore. All it can do is sniff for danger in everything and in everyone until the quality of life for you and those around you, it's not enhanced. It's actually diminished because everything becomes about fearful possibilities. It's like every apple could have a razor in it. And so every apple is eaten with a little bit of apprehension. And then these fears constrict further until some of us can only be motivated by what threatens us. And this means 
Others can make you pay more attention. Others can make you more loyal. Others can make you more supportive by giving you answers that cancel out the sense of pending chaos, by giving you a sense of security in a world that otherwise seems full of unanswered questions. They can motivate you, if you get like this, by giving you something or someone to be afraid of. The, the advancing hordes of migrants, people in other religions, people who look or, or love or live differently than you, some brand of them who are coming for us. I mean, nothing creates movement and unity like a common enemy, a common enemy to fear. And so then fear starts deciding for us that certain dreams and ideas and decisions, they're not worth the risk. I'm worried about other things. Pretty soon, very little is worth the risk. Bad timing is normally the phrase we put forth here. I mean, gosh, how many, how many of us are artists and musicians and painters or some other skill set, some talent, some dream? How many of us let fear make its case that all that light should just be hidden under a bowl because that's just not financially safe. That's not realistic. It's bad timing. Fear ends up deeply affecting our relationships too, of course, because if we don't catch this constriction, we begin to become very distrusting. We challenge everyone because they have to prove to us that they're safe to get behind. We'll be loyal, but you have to earn that loyalty. So we become more and more suspicious and fault finding, going from totally devoted to someone to totally turning on someone with hostility even when they inevitably mess up. L life starts to only be enjoyable to us based on how certain and secure we can be made to feel. The less certainty we have, the more insecure we feel, the more we become tense, the more we, we, we become doubtful and negative. And the irony about this is that if we, if we get this way, it drives others away from us, sometimes even motivating them to withhold things from us because they, they know, well, we can't handle it, which of course makes them less trustworthy to us. And we get trap, trapped in a, in a deepening cycle of distrustful, anxious, isolating suffering. And so this is how wonderful, creative, imaginative, loyal friends can become so fixated on what could go wrong to the extent that they, they, they forget they're actually scaring themselves. It's not the world. It's not, it's not necessarily others. It's their future phobic imagination that's become a vice that makes the world seem like mostly a terrible place and therefore life mostly a terrible thing. And so now, Here's the turn. I want to I want to slide something across the table that some simply will not accept. And, and I understand that some just will not accept this, but I'm sliding it across anyway because I feel strongly about this being right. What is so often happening when fear becomes this constriction and the behaviors that follow? What is so often happening? Maybe maybe always happening is that we have lost touch with our own inner wisdom. It's a failure to trust ourselves. I don't trust me, so I have to externalize my energy, my, my authority, and trust others to come through for me, because I can't come through for me. But I don't know if I trust the right people because that would require me to trust my own discernment. Plus, human beings inevitably prove untrustworthy to some extent, and so trusting is dangerous too. And in time, a major facet of my personality becomes defined by suspicion and, and doubt and challenging all authority and distancing my heart from others because more and more I am preferring to just stay in my head, my watchtower, scoping out danger. And the issue is distrusting my own divinely given internal wisdom. And, and, and with this distrusted, you externalize your authority, which leaves you with little more to choose than fight, flight, or, or freeze. Now, in Christian conversations, trusting the self 
is for many people, it's a boogeyman. Seriously, there's, there's a ton of baggage connected to, to what I'm suggesting right now. And I'm, I'm 100% aware of that. Here's something I just came across in, in just the last week. And I have, I've seen countless variations on this over the years, but I just saw this one literally within the, the last handful of days. Satan doesn't whisper, believe in me. He whispers, believe in yourself. Scary, isn't it? The implication here is that Satan is a good encourager. That, that's what makes him evil. He's a good coach. All joking aside, this kind of thinking, which is very popular for, for a lot of Christians, it's rooted in a prejudice against the self, against what God has made, what God has put within us. And so some of us believe that distrusting the self is a sign of strong faith. And there's Bible passages you can pick to support this. Strong faith distrusts the self and instead trusts God. But for so many of us, this just, it's sleight of hand. I mean, how can you be confident you've wisely placed your trust in God if you can't trust yourself to make such weighty discernments? What it's rooted in so often is sort of a cynicism about being human or, or a false humility that really just brings more shame and fear into something that God assures us is about peace and love. And so let me say, coming to trust your inner wisdom it's not a God-rejecting self-reliance. It's, it's not detachment from the community or rugged individualism. It's not, it's not cutting yourself off from the voice of Christ or, the, or even the greater wisdom of the community, which is necessary for all of us. Trusting your inner wisdom is seeing that we've sort of had a tendency to behave as somebody, somebody avoiding what we fear and that that's not at all the same as learning to live in the way of love. It's, it's learning that fear keeps us locked in a survival mode, which is great when, when that's what's required, but it's almost never required for the vast majority of us, most of the time. Which means fear makes us spend unnecessarily entire chunks of our existence fixating on relieving our own fears, which ends up being a fixation on ourselves, which of course is counter to the invitation of self-giving love and the peace of Christ. When we lose touch with our own inner wisdom, we lose touch with the very person Jesus believes in and adores. Remember when, when Peter stepped out of the boat, he, he decided he was gonna try to walk on water with Jesus because Jesus is walking on water. And then Peter gets out there on the water and he sees the storm and the wind and he has this sort of, wait a second, what the heck am I doing moment? And he starts sinking and screaming for help which I think in Peter's defense, Jesus had nicknamed him the rock. So I say he was still very much outperforming his nickname. Anyway, Jesus takes uh, Peter's hand and they get back in the boat. And Jesus says to Peter, dripping wet and a little embarrassed, Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? Now, you you would have a hard time making a case that Peter, the one sinking and screaming for help, looked at Jesus, who's not having any trouble at all, sees Jesus still standing there on the surface of the water, and out of the two of them, Peter decided to doubt Jesus. That is to say, if Peter is doubting, he is doubting Peter. He is doubting that what had been placed in him is, is actually there. Because Peter would be quick to say, I believe in God, I trust Jesus. But at the same time, doesn't trust in this moment what Jesus trusts, Peter. See, he's lost contact with himself in this moment, like we do in our own lives. And losing contact with that inner gift brings about suffering and desperation, first for the self and then ultimately for other people around us. So sure, I have faith in Jesus, awesome. But in what ways does Jesus' faith in me make me live my life more fully, more presently, and less at the mercy of fear? Consider that. What if the message of faith for you today, and, and what might be a constant scouting for disaster, a near constant sniffing for reasons to distrust, what if God's message to you is to get out of your vigilant head 
and more into the depth of your being and your heart. What if, what if the faith lesson God has for you is God saying, I have faith in you. That's not a statement about you being perfect or better than God is. That's not what it is. What if God is saying you don't need to completely outsource your inner authority? You, you have already made it this far, but you haven't allowed yourself to learn the lesson of making it this far. And the lesson is that which you fear, it's, it's not coming to get you. Most of the time, the vast majority of the time, what you fear does not materialize. You know what you're doing. And to the part of us that's afraid of this, what could really be described as it's you're afraid to not be afraid of God this way, this way. Remember, Jesus invited us to call God Father, and good fathers want their children to grow up and live fully, not afraid or perpetually self-doubting, but fully awake to who they actually are, where they actually come from. All good fathers want that. So, so here's how this vice relaxes into the deeper virtue. When we are able to remember in real time to be present, embodied in this moment, with our heart, hearts open, we relax from the vice that we call fear into a virtue called courage. Courage. Take a deep breath wherever you are, whatever your fear is, uh, you know, you got, maybe you've got things coming at you at work or in a relationship, or it's about money or the IRS or a disease, or, and all of those things are real. They do require attention. Wherever you are, whatever's happening in your life right now, take a deep breath, feeling where you actually are in your body right now, and say or whisper, courage. Courage. It, courage doesn't mean ignoring fear. It doesn't mean pretending to not have some thoughts about what could go wrong. It doesn't mean you don't have a plan, that you're not thoughtful. Courage is a way of saying, I feel the emotion of fear, but I do not take orders from the emotion called fear. The, the word courage has a, has a, the English word courage, it's got a French root. It's just the word heart. Courage is heart. Out of your head where dangerous futures are, are created, and into the wisdom of the heart. Cur courage is your depths. It's not stupid. Even though fear will insist that it's stupid, it's naive. No, the heart, the seat of your true self, it's who you really are underneath the vigilance that keeps you armed and in hiding. When the monster of fear pops up, and I, I promise you, it, it's going to pop up soon, it, for some of us, it already has while, while I've been talking. You've already gotten on your phone during this message, so you could check in on your worries. Meetings or, or, or presentations or stats or finances or returned emails, whatever it is. And it's okay. These are old habits. When the monster, the signal called fear arises, the mind normally goes into autopilot. You don't have to decide anything, just some things just automatically start happening. But this is that moment to pause. When the anxieties and the doubts, the intense feelings of, of turning on an authority figure who hasn't, hasn't earned the trust that they demand, the, the threat forecasting, the sniffing for danger, this is the moment to pause, to loosen, to breathe, to be where you actually are, not in the future, but here, and to allow courage to show you this automatic pattern that you so normally slip into. And courage doesn't judge or condemn that fear. It thanks it for its service, de-emphasizes it, and gently and wisely says a few things. It says, and yet still make choices in my life and relationships and work based on what is best, what is life-giving not simply about avoiding pain and death. I can embrace ambiguity and uncertainty. It's uncomfortable, but unknowing is the human condition, and I am human, so I already don't know most things. Courage reminds I don't have to automatically fixate on potential dangers, 
but can rest in the fact that after all that has ever happened, here I am, wise and resilient. Courage says that I, I no longer have to project warmth and loyalty to get others to want to meet my needs. I can be warm and loyal and loving because that's what's actually in me. No matter the storms ahead or whether or not others come through for me. Courage reminds us what fear forgets that the world is far more full of beauty and joy than it is hiding pain and danger. And I can live on this truth rather than in fearful ignorance of it. Courage says, I can feel fear, yet neither attack or run away in light of it. I can pause and tap into my heart, my courage, and be reminded, as Paul put it, that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of healthy thinking. May we be people who are not known by fear or even fear's absence, but by the beautiful faith and the wise, self-aware, peace-filled love of God that we have in our hearts. May we be people of courage. See you next week. Thank you for joining us today and welcome home. If you are in need of assistance during this crisis, please reach out at crosspoint.org help.